This morning, what I'm going to do for our opening, opening prayer, this is the brand new Wisconsin Synod hymnal. So it was just published at the end of last, well, a little bit more than last year. And they've got a couple of new hymns in here. I was looking through the Holy Communion section, and they have one that was actually written by the fellow who was involved in putting the hymnal together. Uh, Michael Schultz was his name. So I'm going to use that as our opening prayer. Just number one, to kind of familiarize you with one of these more, more modern hymns that is used for communion and as our opening prayer for this morning. So we pray. In this holy, blessed communion, plain and precious gifts combine. Bread is truly Jesus' body. Blood of Jesus joins with wine. What a blessing Christ is giving. What a loving, gracious host in his supper well providing what his people need the most. In this holy, blessed communion, Christ and sinners join as one. They, the Father's ransomed children, he, the Father's rightful son. Here the lofty feeds the lowly, each his highly cherished guest. Here the guilty taste forgiveness. Here the weary find their rest. In this holy, blessed communion, saints are gathered side by side, joined together, brothers, sisters, in one body unified. Faith in Jesus, hope of heaven, love for others all increased by the fullness of the banquet of the richness of the feast. Amen. So any thoughts on the hymn, first of all? It's probably the first time that many of you have heard, heard that. Well, you didn't hear the music for it, but at least the words of it. What are your initial thoughts on the words for the hymn? Anybody have any thoughts? Beautiful. Yeah, very beautiful. Okay. Yeah, dealing with communion. It's a, I think it's a nice summary of all of the things that we've been talking about in connection with the Lord's Supper and the different aspects that we've been talking about. The real presence, uh, the relationship between the bread and the wine and Christ's body and blood, the relationship between the fellow communicants. It's kind of all su summarized very nicely in those three stanzas, as well as the blessing that the Lord offers to us through it. So I won't play you the melody. Uh, so sometimes people like the words, but they don't like the melody. Uh, or sometimes it's hard for us to get used to a new melody too, even though we like the words of those hymns. All right. Uh, you should have sung that. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, I, sh I, shouldn't, I shouldn't have. <laughs> so what I would like to do this morning is kind of review what we have covered over the last couple of months. Uh, from what I heard, you guys had a little bit of discussion two weeks ago as you summarized this, uh, this last paper. We've covered... Three major things. We've covered what the scripture says about, about Holy Communion. We've talked about what the Lutheran confessions talk about and say about Holy Communion. And then we've taken a look at the practice of the church over the centuries and what the practice has been, starting from the book of Acts and then moving into the New Testament period. And then this paper that, that I gave to you kind of did a summary of why it is that we got to where we are today. So it presented some of the reasons for why Lutheran churches in particular have gotten to the point where they only celebrate the Lord's Supper once a month. Uh, so some of those were the questions that we had early on. Why do we do what we do today? We don't know anything different than what we have practiced during our lifetime. And really in our churches, it hasn't changed much with the exception of a few of you that came from different church backgrounds that might have had a little bit of a different practice. So I guess my first question for this morning is, what are some of the things that you have learned about the celebration, the institution of the Lord's Supper that might be beneficial for us as we... So let me back up. One of the reasons that we did this study was because we had a request that came to the church council about offering the Lord's Supper more often than simply once a month during our worship service. So that's sort of what precipitated a study of the Lord's Supper and going back through all of this. So I guess question number one would be, what have you learned from the three sections that we've studied, the scriptures, the Lutheran confessions, the history of the church that you have found unique, beneficial, um, something that you've learned, something that you didn't know before? Any thoughts? Coming, coming from a very reformed background, I was rather shocked by some of the things at first. Okay. But they make total sense. 
So you're probably talking about things like the real presence. Real presence, yes. Yeah. Yes. It, it, like we say, in, with, and under. And never heard that phrase before. Right, right. So we talked a lot about the spiritual presence of Christ's body and blood, which is kind of the phrase that's used by the Reformed. Or, uh, where's Kayla? What are our two, uh, our two groups, the, the names of the two people? Crypto-Calvinist. Crypto-Calvinist? And sacramentarian. And sacramentarians. Okay, so that's another, those are two other terms that were used by the Lutherans. We simply use the term maybe the Reformed churches today, uh, but that would be that group, and that's some terminology that they would use. Anything else? What other thoughts? John? One thing I learned uh, when I was visiting my sister, who was Catholic, I went to Mass with them, and they have the, what they call the host, the bread. And most of them take that, but there are some that want the wine. Okay. So then at the end of the giving out of the host, they have those that want the wine, and they dip the host in the wine okay. and give it to them. Okay. So that's actually something that's called intinction. That was a a practice that was used for centuries in the church where they would actually dip the wafer in the wine and then give it. And there were a couple of different reasons for that. One of them was, um, remember that the Catholics had concerns since it was the very blood of Jesus that it would get spilt as somebody was drinking. So if they, if they dipped it, there was not the likelihood of spilling the cup since the communicant wasn't touching or holding onto the cup. Um, it, there was also beneficial in, in certain places where wine was hard to get because you, there's less wine that is used through the process of intinction as opposed to drinking from the cup. So there were a couple of practical reasons why they would use the practice of intinction. Not wrong or right, but it's one practice that has been used. I saw that when I was in Africa, uh, the practice of intinction, because they couldn't get wine or it was very expensive, and it, so it was a way of conserving the amount of wine that was used. Any other thoughts? So then how did they say the words if they were giving it both at the same time? So some places don't even actually have the practice of doing what we do where, so the words of institution are used during the consecration while everything is on the altar. So we have the practice of, as the pastor goes around, repeating those words, but that isn't necessarily the case in every custom. Oh, okay. So if you're doing both at the same time, you could either just say it all at the same time or just not say it at all. Sometimes you'll see, like in the Greek Orthodox Church or other churches where they say something else, like, may this body and blood of Christ bless you, or you know, something along those lines. So they don't actually use what we have in our Lutheran hymnal. Other thoughts? So let's talk a little bit about what we might have as options as a church or as a group of believers when it comes to celebrating the Lord's Supper. As far as how often we would celebrate the Lord's Supper, what would be some options? And we, we talked a little bit about this in the past with some of the different customs or ways in which people were raised. But what would be some, what would be some options? Every other. Okay, so every other week. Okay, every week. So they used to have it every day. In some churches, they still might do that. That's kind of gone by the wayside, at least in the United States of America, with the daily mass. Uh, but that would be another possibility is uh, every day, at least at some point in, in history. Monthly as we do it. What's that? Monthly as. Yes. Okay, monthly. Once a month. Or five months. What? Mm -hmm. Would yeah. that be the same as every other? How would you? Yeah. You'd have a different schedule. Right? You'd have to keep track of where you were at. I mean, it's not the first and the first. So those are similar, but you're right, you get a little bit of a different number. So there are some churches that practice the Lord's Supper quarterly. And I know of at least one, I wouldn't call them a Christian church, uh, but I know of at least one uh, group of, I don't even know what to call them. It's the Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, they practice it once a year. 
they only do that sort of like the Jews celebrating Passover. They would only celebrate the Lord's Supper one time a year and it would have been in connection with the, the, the Passover feast or when that would be marked. So this probably covers just about every other, every option that we could, we could probably throw a few changes into it like in, the, in certain churches they would do uh, maybe every work week or every other week or maybe even monthly but then throw in some special services. So here at Grace, we throw Ash Wednesday or Monday Thursday, our services where we have the Lord's Supper. Uh, some churches celebrate the Lord's Supper on Christmas or on Easter, even if it doesn't fall on one of their regular monthly or whatever their practice happens to be. So that kind of goes back to the ancient church also, because when they were doing it every week, they would do it every week and then on every festival, high festival day. So Easter, Christmas, Ascension, all of those would have the Lord's Supper connected with them as well. So if we were to, if we were to break this down, let's talk a little bit about which of these we might consider to be viable options for us at a, as a congregation and which would not be. Would not be every day. Okay, so we might say uh, every day would not be a viable option. Would everybody agree with that? Is there any, any dissent that no, we would like to see communion every day? So probably in our culture today, in our world today, that's probably un, an unlikely uh, possibility. So I'm going to erase every day. Any others that you would say probably aren't viable? Yearly. Yearly? yearly. And quarterly. Okay, so we're going to race yearly. Is there any dissent to that vote? Quarterly. Okay, so quarterly? Mm -hmm. I should be asking why. There's no dissent to the yearly, but it was interesting. Luke brought up the connection that the Passover was mm -hmm. celebrated once a year and that the Lord's Supper replaced the Passover. I just thought that was an interesting connection. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want it only once a year, but it just kind of was an interesting... So just to that point, I think that's a valid point, but something to consider in connection with that, because I think that is exactly why the Jehovah's Witnesses, for example, would celebrate it once a year, or the Jews continue to celebrate Passover. But we have to remember that there's a difference. Even though the Lord's Supper replaces or takes the place of Passover, there's a difference between them. And that is that the Lord's Supper is a means of grace, whereas the Passover is not. And so we do have to kind of keep that in mind as we go through and talk about how often are we going to celebrate the Lord's Supper, just remembering that what the, just like we had in that prayer, that what the Lord is offering to us here is something that he did not offer to his Old Testament people through the Passover. So that's, a, that's an important distinction. Sandy? Um, I'm just curious about the Jehovah's Witnesses. What do they do from Summer Ash? They would view it as a, a memorial meal. Yeah, just Correct. So it's not, it's not giving the forgiveness of sins or anything. like They have no, no concept of atonement in, in their religion. It's, it's work righteousness. And so they would view it sort of like the Reformed churches of coming to the Lord's Supper. This is what I am doing for God as opposed to this is what God is doing for me. And the same thing in a sense is true of the Passover. The Passover was a memorial meal. But in essence, the Passover meal was not necessarily something that God was doing for his people. He was simply reminding his people of what he had already done, as he also then pointed them ahead to the spotless Lamb of God that would come to take away the sins of the world. So it was, it was pointing ahead to what God would accomplish, but he wasn't actually doing anything for them in the Passover meal, if that makes sense. Okay, any other? So quarterly. Would we think that quarterly would be a wise idea? No, no, no. Okay. So we've got three left, one of which is our current practice here at Grace. Uh, every other week or bi monthly, depending on how you want to do it, this is the practice of a number of congregations within our church body. If we go to other Lutheran churches, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, in fact, a growing number of uh, Wisconsin Synod and ELS congregations are now going to every week communion, as you can kind of tell from the study that we had, which was from a, a Wells pastor. So are there pros and cons to the three that we have left over? Or what might be the pros and the cons of the three remaining possibilities? So let's start, let's start with what we currently do, the practice of celebrating the Lord's Supper monthly. 
what would be, so we'll come back to these two. What would we say would be the pros and the cons of celebrating the Lord's Supper on a monthly basis? Okay, so we're limited with options. Now, here we, I offer the Lord's Supper anytime that somebody wants it, but there are those that really appreciate the, the ability to join with their fellow believers. There are those that really do appreciate a private communion opportunity too, but for different reasons. They kind of have a, there's a different flavor between the two of them. Okay, so a limited as far as the options that we have. Any other thoughts, pros and cons? Pro, we always know when it's going to be. It's the first Sunday of month. Okay. That might be a pro for every single one of these as long as it's advertised, right? Yeah. Any others? Well, pro is something to look forward to. Whereas weekly... It wouldn't be a special. So let's talk about that for just a minute. If we go back to yearly, the Jehovah's Witnesses might say, well, if you celebrate it yearly, then you have something to look forward to. And it makes it more special because you only do it once a year, right? Yeah. So that's a little bit. That isn't enough. Well, but, but that's <laughs> what I'm saying is that's a little bit subjective, isn't it? Yeah. So uh, that's part of, part of the problem that we run into is that, that what makes it special or how often makes it special, that, for, that can be kind of a personal thing. And going back to, I forget who it was that made the comment earlier, um, when you think about the Lord's Supper as being special, is the Lord's Supper special no matter how often we celebrate it? Yes. Absolutely it is. That's one of the things that we've learned. And so I think what maybe what you're and, and uh, we think about is that maybe it becomes less special because we take it for granted is maybe the key, right? Uh, so, but that's a personal thing as opposed to an objective thing that's true for everybody. The Lord's Supper is special, whether it's celebrated once a year or every day. So the question that we're really wrestling with is since we know that it is special and since we know that God is offering us something that is extremely valuable that we can't get anywhere else, now the question is, how often should we as a church make that available? Especially knowing that maybe people have different feelings as far as how often they should or shouldn't because of how they feel. But our feelings can change too, can't they? So I think about some of you that grew up having, did anybody here have the Lord's Supper celebrated every week when they were growing up or at any time in their life? So nobody here. Uh, but I know a number of you have had opportunities to celebrate the Lord's Supper more than once a month. So maybe twice a month or bi-monthly like we we're talking about. I know there's a few of you that had that tradition in the churches where you grew up. So again, um, when you take a look at churches that are moving in the direction of celebrating it every month, I think they understand, yes, this is special, but there are differences as far as the feelings that we have as individuals to how often we, we don't want it to become uh, something that we take for granted, I think is kind of the key in that. Okay. Yes? Oh, I'm, I'm not sure about work. I'm looking at um, to receive the comfort in the spring. I think it would be wonderful to have that more often than once a month, personally. I would enjoy it. So we could probably just put limited blessing. In a sense, we're limiting the blessing that we're receiving, right? Mm -hmm. By saying we are only going to have this, just like if we were to do yearly, we would be limiting the, the, the number of times that a person could receive what it is that God is offering to us in that, okay? Any others? We have a comment over here. Yeah? Well, I was just going to say on the two times a month, you know, I know I was one of them that commented a couple of weeks back about the, the number of of times that the church that I went to when I was growing up had communion. But in reality, it was only once a month for each one of those groups because you have your group of people that always go to the 8 o'clock right. service, you have your group of people that always go to this service and that service. So it ended up being where it was 
generally a once a month thing. Sure. It's just depending upon which service you go to is when you're going to get that communion. Sure. So, you know, that's all I was going to say. Okay. Nathan? So we have a con. You only officially examine yourself once a month. Okay. You can keep that for 29 days. <laughs> <laughs> That one day I made my confession and I'm done for the month. <laughs> right? Okay? And, and to realize, so not only did, did since Sandy brought out the blessing of what we receive, the forgiveness of our sins, the assurance of that, but to Nathan's point, the, the, the practice of examining our hearts is an important thing, and it's, it's the kind of thing that we shouldn't limit just to receiving the Lord's Supper even. It's important to do that in connection with the Lord's Supper, but I think like, like he was indicating, sometimes we say, well, I only do that when I prepare, you know, prepare for the Lord's Supper. I don't need to do that at other times. That's not the attitude that we should have either, because that's something that is extremely valuable for us, even though it is directly tied to our preparation for the Lord's Supper. Sandy? And when you do examine yourself, <laughs> you, you crave. Right. Right. Well, it's kind of like, uh, so in Luther's Christian questions, when I go through that with the catechism students, since there are 20 of them, I make them basically memorize four, which we reviewed earlier. So am I a sinner? Am I sorry for my sin? Do I believe that Jesus died to take my sins away? Do I believe that Christ's body and blood are present in the, in the earthly elements of bread and wine? But one of my favorites of, of Luther's is, what should I do if I don't crave or desire the Lord's Supper? And do you remember what his answer is? Well, he doesn't actually mention pray. He's got a really... You, see if you're still in the world. Yeah, he says, pinch yourself and see if you're alive. Because if you're alive, this is offering you something that you need. You know, do, and, and to your point, do we realize what our sin is and what the need that we have is, which Christ then offers to us through his body and blood? So it's kind of a, it's a very Luther-like illustration where he says, okay, pinch yourself to see if you're awake. Uh, and, and then if you realize that you are, you should say, yes, I need this. Others? Pros and cons? Anybody can... in the sense that you might be tempted to go, well, I just examined myself last week. I know I'm still sinful, here I go. I almost feel like you, I, I think I take it more seriously when it's a monthly thing. So I think that's kind of going back to what Dory was saying too with the, with the, the fact that that's sort of an individual thing and the preparation for it, the, the special nature of it, you know, all of that. But I think, again, all of those things would be true if, if that's true. I think that's because we've become so accustomed to once a month. If we, had, if we had the Lord's Supper on a yearly basis, like the Jehovah's Witnesses, if that's what we had grown up learning, I think we'd be struggling going to this because we'd say, well, it's special if we only do it once a year. And it's you know, the idea of confession and all of that. I think part of this, why this is a struggle, is because this is what we know. And we've, got, we've gotten into, it's, it's a habit, whether it's a good or a bad habit, that kind of depends on the person. And we can take any habit and turn it into something that is bad. We can also take those habits and we can continue to benefit from them. So each one of those things, I think, again, some of the pros and cons are gonna be a little bit subjective or individual based, depending on where we are and what our feelings are and what our customs are in preparation for the Lord's Supper, all of those things. So if we, any other thoughts on monthly? If we were to go to, let's just say bi-weekly or twice a month, so the church that I grew up with when I was a child had, we had communion, of the, I think it was the first and the third Sundays of the month. Uh, so that was something that was a custom for, for the congregation that I grew up in. And I don't know when they had that practice, if that was a practice that they had when they came out of the Wisconsin Synod and they just kept it. I don't know the history behind all of it. I just know that that was the way that they practiced it. When you think about going to, to bi-monthly or twice a month or weekly, I was thinking about Wade's comment earlier. Sometimes, since this is a little bit personal, 
when we talk about pros and cons, I've heard some people say, well, it just wouldn't be special if, we, if, I, if, I, if I had to take communion every, every week. And, and I think one of the things to think about is that just like with Wade's church, or with the church that I had when I was growing up, and some of you others have celebrated or seen that also, it doesn't mean that you have to take communion every single time that it's offered. So for part of us, it helps us to, to be able to kind of maybe just reacclimate to something that's different without having to do it every time. And I think sometimes with the, the monthly process that we have, we think, well, you know, what are people going to think if I don't go up to communion this month? Uh, so I've heard people say that before, where they're going to think, well, something's wrong with me, or, you know, I did something, or there's all these thoughts that kind of go through people's heads. Uh, if, if, but I think, first of all, we have to remove that. First of all, we shouldn't be thinking that of other people, number one, because that's a personal thing for every one of us. Uh, we should show concern to our, our brothers and sisters in Christ, and it might be valuable for us to say, you know, uh, I, I noticed that you didn't take the Lord's Supper. Is there something that's bothering you? Or are you, are, is there something that, you, that you're concerned with? Is there something that you know, I can help you with in connection with that? That might be a valuable thing. But not to judge them and say, well, you know, they didn't take the Lord's Supper this month, so uh, they must have done something bad. I think if we were to celebrate it more often, that might be less likely. Because what would happen, I think, is that if you, let's say you had it every week, you would probably have a variety of different people that might say, you know, I'm going to continue to go uh, once a month and I'm going to use the first Sunday of the month. Somebody else might say, you know, I'd really like to take it twice a month and they might choose the second and the fourth Sundays of the month. You'd probably have a variety of different people taking it on different Sundays. And so it would be less maybe obvious that somebody, because there'd be more people that wouldn't be taking it every single time that it was offered. Now, maybe somebody do does every single time that it's offered. That's a possibility too. And there's nothing wrong with that. And we shouldn't look at that person and say, oh, what are they thinking? Maybe they, they must not be preparing themselves because they're going every single time. How could anybody do that? So there's a whole lot of things that we shouldn't be doing as Christians as we think about the practices of other individuals and their use or non-use of the Lord's Supper. But by offering it more often, the one thing that we are doing is we are making the options available more often to the individual communicants. We're making the opportunity for them to receive the Lord's blessing something that they can receive more often with their fellow believers. It also helps us to be able to say, you know, I have the opportunity, again, to examine myself a little bit more carefully or to get back into that habit once again. So we don't, and we, we can, if we fall into one of these other categories, um, something to look forward to, or like Deborah said, the idea of examination, that can be an individual thing where we say, you know, I just, I'm not ready to take it every single week or twice a month or whatever it happens to be. So any thoughts? This isn't about the golden cons, but the registration of communion. When I grew up, my parents would visit with the pastor mm -hmm. for registration rather than just yep. signing the paper. Yep. So that was the custom that we had when I was a child, too. Uh, I remember very vividly when I was confirmed, uh, even before that, but we would go in on the first, uh, well, first and third Sundays of the month. There was a uh, Bible class would get done early, and the pastor would go up to the cry room. And I remember a long line as people were going into the nave of the church. They would go through the cry room. They had a couple of, you know, 30 seconds or a minute with the pastor. Some were longer, some were shorter. Uh, but there was a long line waiting to go in. And I remember by the time I got into the ministry, that practice had basically died out, both in my home congregation and in other congregations as well. And it's something that I've tried as a pastor to reinstitute because I think it's an extremely valuable practice in a lot of different ways. But it's one of those things that in our modern world today, I just have not been able to get people to come back. Now, you know, many of you, how many of you remember that practice? Just a couple? So just a few. Uh, I think it's an extremely valuable practice of, of just the opportunity to uh, personally uh, say, I'd like to announce for communion. It gives the individual communicant the opportunity to talk to the pastor if there's something that is concerning him or her. It also gives the pastor the opportunity to say, you know, I've got some concerns with something, you know, let's, let's wait and let's have the commun communion later on or let's take, set, set some time up to discuss this. So I think there's a lot of benefits to that as opposed to what we have now where just anybody walks in on Sunday morning 
And there have been times where I've had somebody come up to the communion rail that wasn't a member. Uh, and, you know, so then you either have to, you have to try to catch them at the communion rail and, and say, I can't give you the Lord's Supper for this reason or that reason, which is inconvenient and embarrassing. Uh, if it's something that is seen, you try to do it quietly, but that can eliminate some of those issues too. So that's a good practice. Yeah. We were from a smaller country church, and the members would actually go to the personage. Oh, yeah. On a, during the week yeah. or whenever. That, that was what I did in Atlanta. I, I opened up the parsonage uh, all day Saturday, or I forget the certain hours or what I did, uh, but I had the uh, door that came right into the office in the parsonage. And so people, there were a few people that took advantage of it, but they were generally um, the ones that were close by. It was a very widespread congregation. But I still think it's a good, a good practice to have. You could either do it at church or, or somewhere off-site, but make it available. So it's kind of like confession? Like not a, I mean, it could be, but, but by itself, no. I mean, you're not going to say do five Hail Marys. Correct. Right. No. Right. I never made anybody do satisfaction, no. Uh, <laughs> But it was simply just an, I think, number one, you know, it's, it's, it's a reminder that I should be examining myself before I take communion, as opposed to just checking your name off of a, a sheet, you know. You say something like, this has been bothering me, this is a sin, yeah. I know it's a sin, but I keep doing it. Sure, yeah, it, it's an opportunity for the individual to, to just say, now, I, now I've, I've got an opportunity to go talk to the pastor. And, and maybe those things that we generally wouldn't talk about, whether it be at church, like you know, Leanne was saying, well, it wasn't at church, it was at the pastor's office. If you were to do that at church, that might be uh, something that you wouldn't do. You wouldn't want to keep a long line of people waiting if there was a long line behind you. But if you were to have it outside of that, I think that, was, that would be something that would be a beneficial thing. And you still could do that, it's just that that might be more uh, uncomfortable. Sandy? Could be a phone call or a text. Yeah. And I, you know, I made that available to people too. It's Just a yep, yep. You know, give 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 me a call and let me know. Uh, sometimes when people text me and say we would like to register for communion, it gives me again at least the opportunity to respond back and say the Lord bless your reception of the Lord's Supper. You know, so it's just a little bit more personal than just signing or checking off a box on a sheet of paper. Did you put that? Oh, oh, really? Well, I was going to say, I could be in there for hours. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> I, I hadn't thought about that in years. The Fridley congregation used to do that. I just remember as a child, you always wanted your parent in the back of the line because that gave you more time of unsupervised time. <laughs> 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 I guess I can see why I'm a teacher. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm surprised that you remember that. I wouldn't remember that. Okay, now, now, okay, now, now you remember. Any other thoughts? So there's a number of practices like the one that Leanne mentioned that used to be common in Lutheranism and were extremely valuable customs or practices or even, you might even call them traditions in connection with the Lord's Supper that have kind of just gone by the wayside. And, and to me... <coughs> A lot of the, the fact that we've lost a lot of those traditions is really a shame because there, was, there were reasons why those traditions were there that were meant to, to encourage the individual communicants in their proper reception of the Lord's Supper. And so a lot of those things have just kind of disappeared. And part of it is, you know, that you get busy and, uh, well, we don't want to take time away from this or we don't want to take time away from that. And so, uh, but I don't think those are necessarily good reasons to stop doing something that's extremely beneficial. Kind of like saying, well, we should only celebrate the Lord's Supper once a year. You know, th that just because, just because um, it seems like it's too often or it's too time consuming or, you know, there's all kinds of arguments like that that you would get for having the Lord's Supper more regularly. It takes time to set it up and it takes time to, you know, clean it up and it takes time in the Lord, in the, the service. So now our, all of our services are going to be an hour and 15 minutes long. You know, that kind of thing instead of saying, well, what is it that the Lord is offering to us here? And is it worth that extra 10 minutes in the, in the worship service? Or is it worth that extra time setting it up every, every week? Uh, those are some of the things that I think we have to be careful about when, when we're thinking about how often we should celebrate the Lord's Supper. Thoughts? Anything else? I was just thinking that when I was growing up, they had the custom that you, first of 
for the most part, announce in person. And you could call too. But I remember on those Saturdays, people coming in and, and visiting, I mean, driving in. And that is a commitment that you make to come in right. and take time out of your day to do that. Right. And I think that does make you take it more seriously. Yeah, so I think the commitment, you know, whether it's more often celebration or the opportunity to talk to the pastor, you're, you, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head that part of that is maybe part of the reason why we've got, gotten away from some of these things. Our, our culture is a culture that is certainly less committed than it has been in the past. And so we're trying to remove things that tie us or make, make us make commitments to certain things. And when it comes to the Lord's Supper, those are things that we probably should not be removing. Uh, that remind us of just how important this is, help us to prepare for it, etc. We are going to have to make sure that we get babysitters, though, for the parents, especially for you know, <laughs> certain, certain children in the congregation. <laughs> Anything else? Other thoughts? I guess, looking back at my past, I can't ever say where I didn't couldn't take communion whenever I wanted to. All I had to do is call the pastor. Mm -hmm. uh, being in the military, uh, I wasn't home for a year and a half, and I hadn't had communion in all that time. I called Pastor Nolting, and for I don't know what reason it was, but uh, uh, Severson was home at the same time. Okay. <laughs> And we had communion together in his office, sure. which was very nice. Yeah. It's, I've, I don't think any pastor would ever turn you down and, no. and say, nah, we're going to have it next week. Uh, you can take it. Right. It's, it's up to the individual. Was that Carlisle? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's, you know, that's an important thing. And I, I try to advertise that as a pastor, just that, you know, a member can, can ask to have communion at, at any time. I say, I'll, I'll meet you here at church. I can meet you at your, at your home. But I still think that th there are people that will take me up on that offer, but it's a, still, it's a small number. And I, and I don't know exactly why that is. If, you know, they don't want to put the pastor out or, you know, there's a whole lot of different reasons why that might be. And it's a little bit different for you when you're gone for a year and you're coming back as opposed to somebody in the middle of the month and they say, well, you know, I could just wait two weeks, you know, and get, and get it then. But that should be... <laughs> well, just, just make sure that you don't come on the same day that Rolene does then. <laughs> But, but all of that, you know, it is important for us to realize that uh, that's what our pastors are here for. And whether we have it on a monthly basis or, or even if we did have it on a weekly basis, again, that still would be the case. Uh, it's, it's the kind of thing that this is something, if we realize what it is that the Lord is offering to us through the sacrament, uh, if we have a desire for it, that's what the pastor's there for, is to offer that to that individual. And so we shouldn't hesitate by saying, well, you know, I, I just don't think that I want to I make him uh, rearrange his schedule or take time out of his schedule. That's, that's an important thing. And I don't remember exactly, but I remember Ross had said they had communion once a month. And then the next week, I think, they offer communion during the offering him. And so I think that's what he had said. So whoever missed it the week before oh. can come up during that hymn and receive communion. Okay. Yeah, there's a variety of different practices there. You know, we, we have in the last, what, two, three years since COVID, I guess, offered communion after church on the second Sunday of the month. And, and we've had a number of people. There are times that on that second Sunday of the month, we might have a dozen people up there. It's not like that every month, but uh, much more regularly. And that's, again, part of the reason that I've been thinking when this was brought up, that there, there might be an interest in seeing it celebrated more often. Again, while, while it's nice to gather up there with a, a number of individuals after church on, on Sunday, the, the order of service that we have that surrounds the Lord's Supper is a beautiful service. And, and this might go back to you know, something to look forward to, but 
I, I'm constantly, I, I don't always get to participate in that part of the service. Uh, because uh, the communion hymn that we sing, usually you guys are singing while I'm distributing the Lord's Supper. And I, I kind of miss participating in the communion hymn because those hymns are so rich and beautiful. But you think about the, the nook dimittis after the Lord's Supper. Lord, now let your servant depart in peace. For my eyes have beheld your salvation. You know, this is a reminder that we've held Christ's body and blood in our hands and in our mouths that he has given us that salvation. That's a beautiful and very fitting hymn that reminds us or reinforces the blessing that God is offering to us there. Or you think about the Agnes Dei or some of those other hymns that we have that lead up to the Lord's Supper that remind us, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world right before we receive the Lord's Supper. So, we don't get that in the second Sunday of the month. We get, I generally will use a brief uh, psalm, a confession psalm, uh, a penitential psalm. We might, we might use one of the variations of uh, confession, but it's not the same as what we find reinforcing the sacrament in the worship service. And, you know, so those things are, those things are extremely beneficial. Again, we have to be thinking about it. If we're not thinking about it, then it kind of goes back to, well, uh, if we're not paying attention to what's going on, that's on us as opposed to on the liturgy or what's taking place in the service because the Lord is he's assuring us and reminding us of all of these things that we have to look forward to in the celebration of the Lord's Supper. See, that's why, why for me, if you had it every week, it, it wouldn't, you lose some of that specialness. I mean, I go on Monday, Thursday, and then if it's first Sunday, right. I go on Sunday also. So it's not that, but it's just, I don't know. You take it for granted. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's, I don't know. We're gonna do a narrative service coming up uh, in February. And generally when we've done those, those are not on communion Sundays. But I, I was thinking about that because as a result of not doing on a communion Sunday, what happens is we actually don't do the narrative part of the service of the parts that deal with the actual celebration of the Lord's Supper. So I think this February when we do that, uh, I'm actually going to incorporate the parts of the liturgy that have to do with the Lord's Supper as well, even though we, m we won't be celebrating the Lord's Supper on that Sunday, just to remind so us. the narrative yeah. service? The narrative service is just where um, we all do the liturgy and then we usually have somebody else who sort of narrates and summarizes what is taking place in that part of the liturgy. So it helps us to be more aware of, just to think about what those parts of the liturgy are doing, what those parts of the liturgy mean, how they fit together, and what they're accomplishing for us. But I don't know that we've ever done one with the communion parts outside of the Bible study that we did when we went through those parts of the liturgy. So I try to do one of those a year just for the very reason of just reminding us once a year. We didn't do one in 2022. Uh, we did one at the end of 2021. And it's, I think it's extremely valuable for us to just be reminded every year. Oh yeah, that's what the Kyrie is there for. That's what it means. This is what the Agnus Dei is there for. And, and this is why it's so meaningful in connection with the Lord's Supper. Any other thoughts? Yes. Um, also another choice, I guess, is those that have live stream church. Um, they offer communion to people that are at home. Um, I saw that. With, uh, I think I brought that up once before. At Messiah, they did that at the teachers' convention. I have never seen that. Yeah, so there's a little bit of a debate as to whether that's a it's whether that's a good idea or not. Uh, a lot of the larger congregations are doing that because it's easy to make it available to a larger group of people. Uh, but there's been a lot of discussion in the Missouri Synod, the Wisconsin Synod, and the CLC about whether we should really be doing that kind of thing. And part of it has to do with closed communion. So when it's made available online, you have absolutely no control over who is celebrating the Lord's Supper online with you. So if you announce that before you give communion, so it, it is, but, but still, when I was in Atlanta, I had an individual, he came in, he was not a member of our congregation, I talked with him beforehand and I said, uh, you know, we, we celebrate close communion, 
and I'd like to visit with you before you partake of the Lord's Supper with us. He said, oh, that's fine. Uh, the sermon that night, it was a Monday Thursday service, was on the doctrine of the Lord's Supper. He heard the sermon, and he came up for communion afterwards. And so I, this again, it was one of those situations where I, I had to skip over him and I grabbed him afterwards and I said, you know, we had talked a little bit about that. And he said, well, I agreed with everything that you said in the sermon. <laughs> so, so just because you say, you make the statement that we celebrate closed communion and nobody, you know, that we, we only want to make this available to those who are of our faith and for all of these different reasons, doesn't mean it's going to stop anybody from doing it. If you do it in person, you still have the ability to not give that individual communion, but you can't control that when it's online. So the Missouri Synod and the Wisconsin Synod both have actually written statements uh, by their, their leaders that say, this is something that we should not be doing. So it's, it's kind of interesting, uh, and it's something that we're discussing in the CLC, but there is, there's a lot of concern just in connection with closed communion and the, the freedom that people now have outside of our fellowship. Yes, they have the ability to make that decision and, and yes, it's on them, but that doesn't mean that if I tell somebody you shouldn't take communion with us and they come up to the altar that I'm gonna give them communion. It's still on them, but I'm still not going to, I'm still not gonna be a participant in that if I can help that. Uh, so anyway, that's a, that's a whole another uh, discussion in and of itself. Um, it also does remove you from the the group of believers, since it's digital, and there's concerns that people have about the digital nature of the Lord's Supper too, whether that was something that Jesus actually intended when he instituted the Lord's Supper. The whole idea is that you're gathering together a group of believers to celebrate the Lord's Supper together, which is lost in the whole digital nature. So just because something is done digitally doesn't mean it's necessarily something that is a wise thing for us to do. But that's, a, like I said, that's another conversation altogether. I, what, what I've seen is that people are encouraging people, like Dave was saying, instead of participating in some sort of a digital or online format, ask your pastor to come out and give you communion. That's better than participating through the internet or, or something like that. And, and to Dave's point, there shouldn't be any pastor that says, well, no, I'm sorry, uh, I'm not available to do that. That should be something that we should be eager and willing to do. Well, I know during during COVID, Sherry Dillmeyer really, really appreciated it. She said Nate would stop at church and get those individual cups and then bring it home. And so she said, we really appreciated it because we watched on live stream and so we were with, we felt we were with, and we were able to receive communion when everybody else did. Yeah, but so that has to do with the closed communion issue, that you might have somebody that, can, that feels like they benefit from it. The question is, by opening it up and making it available to everybody, is that wise on a larger level, you know, on a bigger scale? No, they were so. members of the church. Right, right, but for the person who's watching the live stream, who's not a member, what you've, oh, what you've yeah. done is you've now made that available for them to sit down with bread and wine and take the Lord's Supper possibly to their harm or to their judgment. Because, so we've stopped putting, we've stopped recording and broadcasting the Lord's Supper with our worship service since COVID for that very reason. Since the, I'd never thought about it before. But because of COVID, with now the encouragement for people to participate online, and hearing about people joining in other people's worship services and participating in the Lord's Supper with them. A lot of churches have stopped broadcasting the communion portion of the liturgy for that very reason. So there's, there's two sides to that. One side is, well, now you have members that can't participate, but the other side is you're also eliminating non-members from participating. Yeah, but how would they get the bread and wine? You can get bread and wine anywhere. As long as, if they're watching the live stream on a regular basis, they don't need to go to the church to pick it up. You can pick it up at the store and have it in your house. I can kind so. of see that being, uh, I can kind of see that practice during COVID when there was no other option. We, could, we weren't allowed to come to church. I can kind of see, that being beneficial to COVID, but I can also see yeah. how it might be to, to continue that long term. Right. And I think the main point is if it's kind of like our, our discussion of what do we use for uh, 
the Lord's Supper. We use unleavened bread, not bread. And that's because unleavened bread is what Jesus instituted it with. We know that when we receive unleavened bread and, and grape wine, that's exactly like Jesus instituted it. We have the assurance this is the Lord's Supper when it's connected with God's Word. But whenever we keep taking steps back further away from that, it brings into question, are we actually celebrating the Lord's Supper as we remove or change it? So if you go into a church that has grape juice and crackers, uh, is that really the Lord's Supper? If they use uh, blueberry wine and um, leavened bread, you know. So whenever we change what Jesus instituted, we have, it, it brings into doubt whether or not we are truly practicing it and receiving what Christ gave us. And so there's a little bit of that with the digital nature too, since that's just not what God intended. He intended for his believers to sit down together and receive that and share that together. So... But that might be a valuable discussion uh, when we finish discussing it in our own church body. I could share some of the conversations or the papers that have been written in uh, the Wisconsin Synod and the, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. Uh, but it is something that's, that's kind of being discussed as a result of COVID and bringing into... There's things that we'd never thought of before that are, people are now using it in a way that it shouldn't be used. All right. Uh, let's close with the blessing of the Lord. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen.